wonderful. Her name is Jeannie Nicholson, and I had the pleasure of working with her when I was medical director of the two clinics in Blackhawk in Netherlands, 1990-92. And she was the public health nurse for Gilpin County and also teaching health to the middle school children up there. And uh, it's just a treat to be able to introduce her to you today. Jeannie? Thank you. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I had a terrible infection, and it required penicillin. <coughs> and I broke out in hives. And I went to my physician um, for um, some epinephrine, and I walked in the door of the doctor's office and walked up to the counter and said to the woman who was sitting behind the counter, I'm Jeannie Nicholson, and I'm going into anaphylactic shock. And the woman behind the desk said, that'll be a $20 copay. <laughs> I've been practicing nursing, I'm licensed to practice nursing in Colorado for 50 years. I started my career in a little hospital in Gunnison, the Gunnison Memorial Hospital. When people walked in the door for care in that hospital when I was a young nurse, we didn't ask them how they were going to pay for their care. We asked them, what's wrong and how can we help? This evolution that's occurred over time from when I started my career 50 years ago to now has changed from the patient being the priority to profit being the priority. And that does not seem right with me. In fact, it just does not sit well at all. And for that reason, um, many years ago, I became interested in universal health care and wanted us to begin to look at another way for us to finance health care so that everyone could have a platinum plus health care coverage plan in our state and indeed in our country. Um, I know that many of you are very interested in making sure that the entire country has affordable health care, high quality health care, and so am I. But there is a difference of opinion among some of us about how we get there. And I believe, given the current political environment in Washington, D.C., we have a better chance of beginning this process of having universal health care in our country by starting state by state. And in Colorado, we have um, worked hard Many, many people, over 500, almost 600 people, have circulated petitions, perhaps some of you, um, in order to get Colorado Care Yes on the ballot in 2016 to ask the voters, do you want to pay for health care in our state in a different way that will mean that every Colorado resident is covered and that they have a platinum plus health care plan and that we save billions in our state by making this change. So um, today I want to talk to you about this plan and uh, of course I'm hoping that you will help us to promote this throughout the state in the next many months so that when people go to the polls or fill out their ballot at home that they vote yes for this measure so that everybody can have Platinum Plus health care in our state and we can save billions and we can design it in Colorado so that we can deal with some uniquely Colorado challenges for delivering health care as well. So um, let me start by um, just talking a little bit about what's wrong with the current system, and I know I'm speaking to the choir, so I'll go through this quickly. Um, as you know, um, the number of uninsured has improved in Colorado over the last few years because of the Affordable Care Act, and I'm very pleased about that. I would imagine that you are very pleased as well. We, however, still have a number of people 
who are uninsured in our state. In fact, the estimate is somewhere around 350,000 people in Colorado are still uninsured. But what I think is a more instructive um, look at this particular chart is how many people are underinsured. And that, that is a trend that's going in the wrong direction. So now, good, people have health insurance. We're glad. But it's not very good health insurance coverage in many cases, which means that if they really have a medical crisis, they will probably be significantly challenged in terms of being able to pay for the care that they will need, or they will choose not to get the care that they need. Um, so my contention is that all of us are paying, those of us who are paying health insurance are paying too much for our insurance premiums. And the reason I say that is because there's so much waste in the system right now. Um, there's a, a whole section of the coverage costs that is considerably uh, significant money that doesn't need to be spent because it's on administration and it's not on the direct care. It's not paying the nurses, the doctors, the therapists, the people who really keep us healthy uh, or help us recover. It's paying uh, people to process the claims. And of course, we still need to have some administration, but it doesn't have to be nearly as much as it is right now. And so this is a slide that just shows how much uh, we're wasting um, as a country in unnecessary services, services that are repeated, that didn't need to be repeated, um, insurance and bureaucratic costs, inefficient care and errors, excessive prices and fraud. We can't eliminate all of this, but we can eliminate a significant amount of this if we redesign the way we pay for health care. Um, I think this is interesting. Um, we waste $750 billion a year, not spin, but waste $750 billion a year in our country on health care. And that's more than the entire federal K-12 through budget, just on the waste. Could we not think that that could be better used, that money? Um, let me um, take questions at the very end, uh, but I promise I'll answer all the questions. Just jot them down, because a lot of them are all covered. Um, so um, this is another slide that I think probably most of you are familiar with. This is the increase in the number of administrators that um, we have in our healthcare system now um, in the United States compared to the increase in the number of physicians. Does that look like backwards to you? Um, so um, um, this is kind of fun. If banking were like healthcare, ATM transactions would take days. Would we tolerate that? No. If home building were like healthcare, carpenters and electricians and plumbers would work from different blueprints. And if shopping were like healthcare, prices would not be posted and could vary widely within the same store depending on who was paying. So imagine you go to the grocery store, you don't know how much a head of lettuce will cost, but the person standing next to you is going to pay a different price than you are. Would we think that made any sense at all? But that's how our system is structured. Um, this is a fun slide, I think, because it shows uh, how complicated the Affordable Care Act process is. And um, my opinion is that the Affordable Care Act provided a solid foundation for us to make progress in terms of providing universal health care. I am not uh, an opponent of the Affordable Care Act, but I do think that it can be improved on. And we think that the Colorado Care Plan is a wonderful example of how it can be improved. We think that it can be more affordable, and um, we think that it can be a lot less complicated to apply for um, benefits um, 
than with this very complicated chart. Now, obviously, you can't read the chart on the slide, but the point of it is just to show that it's kind of complicated and to show you what the process would be like when we have power to care. Here's the next one. That's how it will work. Much simpler. Um, you're a Colorado resident, get your smart card, choose a provider, you're all set to go. Not nearly as hard. Um, one of the other trends that we have seen is that um, high deductibles have increased significantly over the last several years. And that's part of that scenario that is playing into so many people being underinsured. It's like, yes, they have health care coverage, but they have a $10,000 deductible. And so they're very reluctant to get any care at all because of that deductible. And if they have a medical crisis and have to get care, they're going to have a tough time trying to figure out how to come up with that $10,000. At the same time, they're already stressed by the fact that they have a serious health problem. And um, this is the um, slide that demonstrates how we perform compared to other countries. And in this particular slide, you see that the United States, the wealthiest industrialized nation in the world, is doing the worst. We are spending the most, and we get the worst outcomes. That's backwards. We should be getting the best outcomes. And we should be spending much less than we are and still getting the right results. Um, this is the same thing in terms, just another way of showing that um, compared to other countries, we are not doing as well. And there is no reason um, that we can't do as well or better than these other industrialized nations. They started in the late 1800s with universal health care systems um, in Germany. Uh, so there's a long, <coughs> long track record of success in being able to cover everyone in your country. It's just greed, quite frankly, that's gotten in the way of us being able to do the same thing. Um, so the paradox is this. There's no question that we have made amazing progress and the United States has, in many ways, led the way for us to make amazing progress in terms of providing outstanding high-tech health care to some people, the people who can afford the care. Um, so we're making great progress, but we're not making great progress in who gets that care. Um, I'm a perfect example of that. I'm a cancer survivor, and uh, probably 20 years ago, if I'd been diagnosed with the same kind of cancer that I uh, just recovered from, I probably would be dead. But because of the technology uh, that's available in our country, and because I was lucky enough to have health care coverage, I am totally um, well and uh, completely survived this very deadly form of cancer. So no one is um, claiming that we haven't made progress. We have, but we have not made progress in terms of how many people are covered um, in a, a very comprehensive way. The Affordable Care Act helped us get there a little bit, but it isn't going to get us there all the way unless we kind of build on it as a foundation and improve it. So here's the solution, because it's terrible to talk about a problem and not have a solution, right? Um, so our solution is to have um, a new health care payment system in Colorado that covers everybody, saves billions, and is um, something that's designed in Colorado by Coloradans for Coloradans. Um, one key feature of this is that you can choose your primary care provider. It could be a, a nurse practitioner, it could be a physician, it could be anyone in the state. You cannot say that now because most of us are confined by the network of the insurance company that we chose. Um, this is not like socialized medicine in the sense that people um, who are in the healthcare business providing care, myself, Judy, um, many of your physicians, um, would not necessarily work for the state. 
we would stay in private practice if that's our choice. Um, and so those private practitioners will continue to have their patient that they care for. But what will be different for them is that they will have one person in their office who just fills out the paperwork and sends it to Colorado Care and says, Jeannie needed an appendectomy and I want you to reimburse me $3,000 for the surgery. And Colorado Care will go, sure, and send that healthcare provider the money for the care that they provided. Much simpler than the system we have right now where um, in the back office of the physician in private practice or the nurse practitioner in private practice are sort of a team of people who are trying to fill out forms for different kinds of insurance companies to make sure that the physician and the nurse practitioner and the people on the staff are paid or reimbursed for the care that they provided. Now, um, some people worry about whether or not people will leave the state. Um, uh, physicians and nurses might leave the state to go someplace else to practice because maybe they won't make enough money in Colorado. Well, that is not the plan. The plan is to keep our health care providers here and to compensate them well for the care that they provide. That's not where the savings will come from, is to cut the costs of um, the uh, income for the health care providers. They're the good guys. They're the people who are trying to keep us healthy or help us recover. So, you know, we don't want to punish them. That doesn't make any sense uh, to punish them in any way by not fairly compensating them. But we don't need to compensate people um, who are just processing this complex paperwork in the administrative side if that part is just not necessary. Um, can you guess, probably many of you know this, what the compensation package was for the ex um, CEO of United Health in 2013 after he had to take a um, deduction in income because of the economic downturn, by the way? 24 million. 24 million. Any other guesses? It was actually 66 million. Mm. Um, another component of this is um, what I call the Platinum Plus Plan, which is the kind of benefits that will be included. As you know, in many insurance policies, health insurance policies, they do what they call carve out certain uh, benefits that they don't cover. And in our plan, I'm proud to say that we cover um, preventive services, wellness services, mental health, substance abuse, counseling services, all of the things that we know uh, keep us healthy. And um, by the way, oral health services too, which of course um, makes perfect sense to me. I think uh, our entire body is connected <laughs> and that you, you know, if you're going to be healthy, you need to have all the health care. And why we fragment those things right now in the system doesn't have to do with health, it has to do with money. And it shouldn't be that way. Um, so our plan also that we're proposing has no deductibles. That's a big deal. No deductibles. And no co-pays for preventive services and modest co-pays for some other services. Um, but even if um, you're having a service that usually requires a copay, in the case of someone who can't afford to pay the copay, there's a process that is built into the system to waive that cost for that person. Um, and of course, children are covered regardless of age. And um, I don't know how you feel about this, but I have sons in their 40s and a foster daughter in her 50s. I still think they're my children, right? And um, so if they needed health care, and they were you know, going to law school or medical school, and they were beyond the age of 26, then my policy could cover them because they're my children and I'm a Colorado resident. Um, and if, even if they were going to school in another state uh, because they're my children and their primary residence is here. 
Um, and if you're temporarily traveling out of the state, um, you would also be covered. And that's a simple thing that happens now, which is if uh, I'm in Tennessee visiting my foster daughter and um, I get in a car accident, get hurt, and break my leg, I go to the health care provider in Tennessee, they set my leg, put, put a cast on it, whatever they need to do, they send the bill to Colorado Care, Colorado Care pays it. <coughs> um, so how are we going to pay for it? Well, we're going to pay for it with a payroll uh, deduction in part, um, and the payroll portion of it look, works like this. The employee would pay three and a third percent, um, and the employer would pay um, two thirds um, of it. So um, it's 6.67 percent um, is the employer's responsibility, and 3.3 percent is the employee's responsibility. And it's just deducted out of the paycheck, just like we deduct Medicare right now. Um, and I would add, that if the employer said, I'm happy to pay more, that's allowable in this plan too and could be negotiated with the employer. So it's conceivable that in some cases the employer would actually pay 10% and the employee would not pay um, their percentage. Um, and so just as an example, on $50,000 income, your employer pays 278 and you pay 139 monthly. Um, I'm going to challenge you to think of whether you on the market today could get a Platinum Plus plan for $139. Um, so non-payroll um, is um, for people who make their income without working for an employer. So one example would be if I owned a lot of rental property and I made my money off of this rental property. Then I also pay into this plan, and I pay theoretically 10%, but it depends on which income bracket you're in, because income tax law also has to um, merge with our um, proposal. And so uh, for some of us who don't make a lot of money, on the rental property, theoretically, um, we would probably pay significantly less than 10% um, in order to be um, putting in our fair share. And for retired people like myself who are on, on Medicare, we would stay on Medicare, A, B, and D. We would stay on that. But we would have the opportunity to have a supplement that would probably be more affordable than the um, amount that we pay now for our supplement. And um, the first income, first few dollars of your income, if you're retired, are exempt. So if you file individually, it's $33,000 um, that's exempt. And if you file jointly, like my husband and I do, the first $60,000. So for example, if my husband and I jointly make $70,000 a year, we would pay 10% on that. 10,000 above the 60,000, and that would be about a thousand a year, um, which is significantly less um, than we pay now for our supplemental. Um, so, more details the premium tax can only increase by a statewide vote. And I'm going to say that again because of the press. There's been some misstatements, lies, about that. Um, it is not true that your premium will just go up and up and up and totally out of your control. That is not true. The board of trustees that will govern this plan can only ask the voters um, once a year or less often than that and the voters have to say, yes, we're willing to increase our, our percentage of our premium tax. If for some reason they felt um, that there, um, there were benefits that they would like that weren't covered um, in order to have the plan as comprehensive as they wanted. But it's up to you. 
Now raise your hand if you think you have control over premium increases now. <laughs> Um, Colorado Care has specific language in it that says it's exempt from taper. The um, uh, statewide um, amendment, yes, inter uh, enterprises won't work um, for this particular measure, but we are exempt from taper in the sense that um, we are asking the voters if they want to pay for this, and we're not going to. Uh, be controlled by the same regulations that Tabor imposes on the state right now. For example, what kind of reserves you can have and what happens to those reserves is a big one that um, we won't be affected by. Um, and another one that's really interesting that people don't talk about, but I think they should, is that car to care will cover you regardless of cost. So if you're in a car accident, God forbid, and you get hurt, car care will take care of you. And there won't be this argument about, well, did you really hurt your back in that car accident, or did you hurt it at home and you're just claiming it happened, you know, when somebody rear-ended you. I'm not making up that story. But um, there will be no question. They will cover it. That should mean, and we'll see how this plays out, I can't promise, is it should mean that your um, medical portion of car insurance will go down. And I didn't even pay any attention to what that was, right? I know what, I pay for my car insurance, I got a Subaru, I pay, you know, so much every six months, a kind of thing for my insurance. But I never really looked at the policy so carefully that I figured out what the medical portion was, but it's actually pretty big. And so I think that um, it's significant for us to track that too. I was trying to uh, explain to this woman who just moved here from Germany. She fell in love with this guy in Colorado. She came from Germany, but she used to work for their health insurance plan in Germany. And I was trying to explain this to her, that we were going to do this, and we were also going to eliminate the medical portion of workman's compensation. And she had this real quizzical look on her face. And I thought it was a language discrepancy. And that's not what her look was about. Her look was, I understood you perfectly, she said. I just don't understand why you would have ever done that. Why did you separate out <laughs> health care coverage for um, car insurance from your health care system? Why did you separate out workman's comp? Why isn't it all one thing? So I said, well, um, we like to make things more complicated than we need to sometimes, I think. And um, we're trying to get back to something that makes sense. Um, so, you get hurt at work or you have an illness because of work. Call to care, covers you, no questions. They don't say, oh, that happened at work, you're going to have to go to a state comp doc. Oh, that happened at work, we're not, we can't cover it through our plan. That's not how it will work. That will save employers approximately 59% of their state compensation costs, which is a good chunk of money for employers. Um, so how would this be governed? I like to say that it's an arm's length relationship with the government, that it will be what we call a quasi-governmental entity in the sense that this will be governed by a board of director of, of trustees, 21 of them. They will come from seven different geographic regions in the state, and they will you will decide who you want on that board to represent your interests for your health care coverage, and you are a member automatically of the organization because it's a cooperative. And a cooperative is nonprofit, and if there's any money left over, the money comes back to the people. Um, so it will be governed by this group. Now, we can't get up to speed immediately. This is a complicated new way to do um, uh, the payments for healthcare. And so it's not gonna be something we can accomplish next week. 
So in the interim, we'll have a 15-member uh, board of trustees that are appointed by leaders in the legislature on both sides of the aisle and the governor. And they'll be the ones who kind of put together the original infrastructure for this organization and help put together the election process for the 21-member board of trustees. Um, and in case you're not familiar with cooperatives, um, cooperatives are very old business model. Um, the Green Bay Packers, REI, uh, lots of organizations use this business model. And the purpose of this model is to say everyone has a stake in this company. Everyone is a member of this company, REI, or uh, Green Bay Packers, or Colorado Care. And that we're not in it to make a profit, we're in it to provide a, an excellent service. And if the um, um, things need to be adjusted, which of course they always do, um, we can, through our membership, make decisions about how we want to either increase benefits or um, change the premium tax if it's necessary in order to cover us. Um, so do you know when you're a, a witness for a jury trial and you go in and they say you've got to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Well, we're anticipating that our opponents will, in some cases, tell the truth, but not the whole truth. And one example of that is the truth. This will raise our taxes $25 billion. And that's enough to take your breath away if you just stop there and don't think about it anymore. And that's what our opponents would like uh, all the citizens in Colorado who vote to do, is to just go, oh, I'm, I'm opposed to that, it's a tax increase. The truth, the, the rest of the truth, the whole truth, is that we're paying much more than that for our health care in Colorado now. All of us as individuals are paying much more for our health care in Colorado now than we would with this system. That we will save not millions, but billions with this new payment system and not compromise the quality of our care or be unfair in terms of compensating our providers. So, um, we know that the estimate from the economists, and by the way, you know, I'm a nurse, so I'm not an economist, um, but the professional economists have looked at this proposal and they have said, yep, these numbers add up, and it is indeed uh, fair to say that you can spend 4.5 billion, maybe more, uh, you, less, spend uh, 4.5 billion less than we do now, maybe even less than that. Um, so uh, the truth, opponents will say Carter Care will cause significant job loss um, in the health insurance industry. Yep, that's the truth. But that's not the whole truth. Um, there will be uh, what we call job churn, and it will mean that there will be uh, some people, uh, the guy that makes $66 million um, might uh, not make as much, um, and other people will lose their jobs in the insurance industry. <coughs> but I like to think of it this way. If you're paying $1,000 a month for your premium right now, and with this change, you can get better health insurance coverage and pay $500 a month for your family to be covered, what are you going to do with that extra $500 that you, had, had, you were forced to set aside for your health insurance? Are you going to stick it under your mattress? Probably not. You are probably going to spend it. And when there is money spent in the economic cycle in Colorado, the economy remains strong, and our contention is that it will create jobs in other sectors. It will not create um, uh, 
net job loss instead of net job gain will occur because this money will be circulating here. And because some of the money now for our health care goes out of state and it will be more concentrated in state with this proposal, it will actually strengthen Colorado's economy. Uh, the opponents will say you will not receive good care um, with Colorado care, but that's not true. That is uh, an old argument that um, opponents have used for years to try to convince people that the status quo is the safest approach because um, they believe I understand this. Um, they believe that um, competition among the insurance companies helps to um, keep the prices low and um, make sure that we have excellent coverage. Uh, raise your hand if you have some good examples of that. <laughs> Okay, so in summary, um, we'll be a Colorado resident-owned system. We will cover every Colorado resident. We will ensure comprehensive Platinum Plus care. Uh, we will collect premiums from Coloradans based on their income. And the costs will be significantly less than they are in our current system. So that's actually something to be really excited about and to talk about. Um, so, uh, this is an old slide um, because um, we weren't on the ballot when we first put this together, but we did indeed uh, collect more than 98,492 signatures to be on the ballot. Um, and we have heard officially from the Secretary of State that yes, um, we qualify, we uh, did turn in enough valid signatures, in fact, um, more than enough valid signatures to be on the ballot, thanks to the incredible work of uh, an enormous number of volunteers, some of you are here in this room. Um, so um, next steps after that are um, to uh, get the legislature to enact what we call enabling legislation. Um, to obtain the Affordable Care Act 1332 waiver uh, to implement chronic care, yes. And um, we don't anticipate problems uh, getting approval from the federal government because language in the Affordable Care Act says if you can cover as many people with your plan and if you can offer as uh, many benefits as the Affordable Care Act, then you can get approval for your own state plan. And if you can do better than that, that's even better. So uh, we indeed can do better with this particular plan. And that's why um, we have the legal authority to move forward with this. Um, and our estimate is that we will be able to, with a lot of hard work, um, actually get this plan fully implemented with um, our um, citizen residents, um, our uh, folks in Colorado uh, enrolled in this program uh, by 2019. And um, by, way, by the way, that enrollment process is really different. I was talking to my son who owns a private business and he has a couple of employees that he worries about because he don't have health insurance and he said, I've tried to get them to sign up through uh, the Colorado um, health op, um, process, and he said, they just won't do it. <laughs> when I was telling him we got on the ballot, he went, that's great, Mark won't even have to sign up. I'll just, you know, deduct this from his paycheck, and <laughs> he'll be there, he'll be covered. Um, so, um, uh, we also know that we need to repurpose the health benefit exchange. It'll be different if there at all, and the reason is the health benefit exchange uh, purpose was to allow people a place to shop for different kinds of affordable health care. And you don't really need to shop anymore that I can think of if you can automatically be in, in a Platinum Plus plan that is the most affordable. 
um, then we will also be managing Medicaid at the state level. So instead of the State Department doing that, Colorado Care would be managing mm -hmm. the Medicaid uh, program. And we would be managing the medical portion of workman's compensation, and we would be collecting federal patient protection and affordable care act monies. And so you can learn more about Colorado Care on our website, CollegateCareYes.co. Um, and I can't imagine that uh, the people in this room are not registered to vote, but even if someone is not registered to vote, um, absolutely do that and encourage anyone you know who is not registered to vote. Uh, we're done with the petition portion of this, but moving on, the most important things that we need to do now are to educate the public about this issue and why it will be in their best interest to support this. So um, we will love having all of you help us with that education campaign. And um, not surprising to any of you, the opponents have very deep pockets. <laughs> and um, they are going to spend a lot of money on uh, trying to tell the truth, but not the whole truth, uh, and sometimes not even the truth. Um, and so we'll need a significant money uh, raised throughout this campaign in order to educate the public about how important this is. So we would love your contributions and we would love your volunteer time as well. You guys, because of your background, are going to make fabulous volunteers if you're not already volunteering for Colorado Care. Um, and of course, bottom line, vote <laughs> yes. Um, in uh, November next year. Uh, it's on the presidential ballot on purpose because we know a lot more people come out to vote in a presidential year. And so please, please, please vote. And please make sure that everyone you know also goes and votes um, because it, the turnout is going to be uh, the game changer in terms of getting this done. We know that we're really good at the ground game. They're really good at spending a lot of money. But we can get this done with a lot of really enthusiastic people who are willing to put in the time and the money to make this happen so that everybody gets excellent health care in our state. Thank you very much.